Hi, and welcome back to Lily Alone by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from part four, chapter seven. It rained again on Wednesday, and I grew desperate, trying to think of some way to amuse the kids. I wish we could go to school. I longed to see Mr. Abbott so that I could go on the gallery trip. I knew I'd be fine. I could lie and bluff until the cows came home, but I couldn't leave the kids to their own devices all day long in the flat. Baxter would break everything and terrorise his sisters. Bliss would tremble into a jelly and Pixie would scream her head off until old Calf came knocking. Then she'd find out Mum had gone off and she'd tell and we'd be taken away to some dumping ground for neglected kids and never be allowed to see Mum again. We couldn't go to school, but perhaps we could play school. I gave the kids a good breakfast, cornflakes and ice cream because we'd run out of milk. Then I told the kids to stay sitting at the kitchen table while I dressed up in Mum's navy skirt and grey top and her navy high heels. Me wear heels too, said Pixie. And me, said Bliss. No, I'm wearing them because I'm your new teacher, Miss Green. You're my pupils, all three of you. You're coming to my special school. I thought you said we were on our holidays, said Baxter. I don't want to go to your stupid special school. Oh, you'll like my school, I promise you, Baxter. Sit down, all of you. I'm going to make you your own little notebooks. Baxter, you can cut the paper with the sharp scissors because you're such a careful big boy. I was taking a serious risk. Baxter might well have run amok with the kitchen scissors and cut off Bliss's thumb and Pixie's curls, but he rose magnificently to the occasion. Under my instruction, he carefully cut six sheets of my previous drawing pad into quarter strips. I gave Bliss a needle and thread and showed her how to sew the folded paper into little booklets. Pixie clamoured to help too, so I set her to sharpening pencils. She liked this job so much, she sharpened them into stumps, but at least it kept her quiet and happy. Right, now lesson time, I said, clapping my hands. Good morning, class. You say, good morning, Miss Green. Good morning, Miss Green, they parroted back. We're going to have a spelling test first, I said. Baxter groaned. I'm not doing boring old spelling, he said, flinging down his pencil. This is exciting new spelling, I said. The first word is knickers. They all giggled. No giggling now, write down knickers. Come on, come along. Neither Baxter nor Bliss knew about the weirdly silent K in knickers, but they did their best to spell it out. Pixie couldn't write anything yet, but she did a lot of scribble at the top of her page, joining in. I carried on, going through as many rude and silly words as I could think of. Quite a long list. Baxter was terrible at spelling, but even he could make an accurate stab at some of them, mostly because he'd seen them scribbled all over walls. When we were done, I pretended to mark their papers and drew them each a big star in the bottom, even Pixie. Now we'll have a maths lesson, I said. We don't do proper maths yet, said Bliss. You can do my maths, I said. It's special counting. Mum had bought a bumper pack of Smarties tubes she'd hidden at the back of the cupboard. I opened them all up and tipped the brightly coloured sweets into our glasses. Ooh, pretty, said Pixie, reaching for a handful. No, you mustn't eat them, Pixie, not yet. This is a maths class. Don't worry, I'll help you. You can be teacher's pet. Will you help me too, Bliss said. You won't need help, Bliss, I promise. Now look at your glass of sweets, OK? Write down in your workbook how many think there are. But we don't know, said Bliss. You have to make a guess, I said. It doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Bliss guessed 40. Baxter guessed 100. Pixie and I guessed 60. Now, here comes the good bit. Tip your glasses up and we'll count how many Smarties we've really got. I can't count that many, said Bliss. We'll all count together, I said. We'll do yours first, Bliss. Tip them out carefully on the table. I helped Bliss start counting, moving her Smarties into neat little rows. We all counted out loud together. Pixie couldn't manage accurate consecutive numbers and yelled, one, two, three, twenty, fifty, a hundred, which was off-putting, but we persisted, doing two counts to make absolutely sure. Bliss had fifty-eight Smarties. Now it's your turn, Baxter, I said. He tipped his Smarties out so enthusiastically that half of them spilled off the table onto the floor. Baxter's Smarties got a bit fluffy, but he didn't seem to mind. He counted hurriedly and not always accurately, so we had to keep starting again. Eventually, we discovered he had 62 Smarties. Hooray, hooray, I've got the most, he said. Well, we don't know for certain, sure. Pixie and I haven't counted ours yet, I said. Come on, Pixie, tip ours out, carefully, that's it. Now, you move them slowly, one by one, from this side of the table to the other, and we'll count them out together. Pixie and I had exactly 60. So we guessed right, Pixie. But I've got the most, so I've won, said Baxter. I'm going to eat mine now. No, 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 wait. This is a maths lesson. Now, let's see. How can we work it so that we all have an equal share? How many Smarties should Baxter give to Bliss so that we've all got the same? I'm not giving my Smarties to Bliss. They're all mine from my glass. Just try putting these into Bliss's pile, I said. 
moving a couple of his smarties. Baxter roared as if I was extracting two of his teeth. That's not fair. Now she'll have the most. Well, let's count and see. So we counted all over again, and of course we all had 60. Well, Pixie must have been secretly helping herself because we only had 55 now. She swore she hadn't had any, but she had little bits of smarty shell glittering on her teeth. I allowed Baxter and Bliss to eat five too, and then we lined all our smarties up by colour. Then we had to count how many were in the pink line, the blue, the yellow, the orange, the red and the brown. Then we tried a complicated swapping game so that Baxter got all the orange smarties, Bliss all the blue and Pat Pixie all the red. She kept licking her lips as she could make lipstick for herself. All the smarties were getting pretty sticky by this time, so I gave in altogether and let them eat their sums. Then I announced that it was playtime, because I couldn't think what to do with them next. Baxter drove his forklift truck all around the flat. Bliss put on Mum's necklace and high heels and played it being Princess Bluebell. And Pixie went to the beauty salon and applied multicoloured smarty makeup all over her face. I got my drawing pad and designed my own kitchen. I'd have a big shiny fridge full of posh meals for one and a long wooden table with six chairs. From Monday through to Saturday, I'd sit at a different chair each time and on some days I'd have my meals on a tray in my own bed, carefully not to spill anything on my beautiful silky sheets. I was a bit worried about the contents of our own fridge. We'd already run out of milk and I'd had to throw away some ham way past its sell-by date because it had gone a bit green. We didn't have any vegetables either, but that didn't matter because nobody liked them. We had some more fish fingers and a big pizza and eggs and bacon and oven chips, plus cake and biscuits and cornflakes in the cupboard. But that was all. It was only Wednesday. We'd have to start rationing things out a little. We'd had all the Smarties just now, so perhaps we could do without lunch. I was willing to give it a try, and I certainly hadn't had my fair share of Smarties, but the others started clamouring, whining that they were starving. The twins were used to eating lots of lunchtime, because we all had free meals at school. I heated up the big pizza, hoping that we might be able to save half of it for tea. But I couldn't stop myself wolfing down my own share when it was there on my plate, and the others didn't even try. We watched cartoons for a bit afterwards, but then the kids started getting fidgety and bored all over again. I want to go out, Baxter moaned. Look, it's raining. We had this stupid argument yesterday. You're not going out, especially if you're just going to hang around those horrible bin sheds. I tried opening up my school again, organising an art lesson, but they weren't in the mood anymore, started chucking my precious felt tips around. I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, Baxter yelled, right in my face. I'm bored too, I shouted back. All right, all right, we'll go out, even though it's pouring. Can we go to the Magic Garden, said Bliss. Yes, we'll go there, but we'll have to watch out for that couple with the dog. We don't want them asking any more questions, do we? I knew it was mad to go out, but there was a roaring in my head and I just couldn't stand to be stuck in the flat with, my, with the kids anymore. I made Baxter and Bliss put on their winter jackets. They didn't have any raincoats, though Pixie had a silly little see-through plastic coat with a matching sou'wester hat. She liked the hat, pulling it down very low so she couldn't see where she was going. She had welly boots too. They were really only baby size, but she didn't mind stuffing her feet in them. We only had our Tesco trainers, but I hoped they were waterproof. I made them all quiet and down in the hall, and then we crept out, leaving the door on the latch. A head-scarfed lady was walking along the balcony, but she just nodded at us timidly and let us pass. The rain hit us full pelts when we were down on the forecourt, but after the first shock it didn't seem to matter. We tilted our heads and drank the raindrops and then ran madly, waving our arms and twirling around like crazy people. Once we were out of the estate, we ran pell-mell down all the streets and around the corner, knowing exactly where we were going now. Ice cream, Pixie panted, hopping along in her stubby boots. But the ice cream man wasn't there, probably thinking he wouldn't get many customers in the pouring rain. When we went in the park gates, it seemed pretty deserted. Only ten or so cars in the car park. I looked around warily all the same, ready to do a runner if Arnie and Elizabeth loomed into view, and spotted a little playground behind a wooden fence. Look, let's have a little play. There's no one there. It's a baby's playground, not a big boy's playground with a den, said Baxter. Can't we go to that magic garden, said Bliss. We'll let Pixie have a little play here first, and then we'll go to the magic garden, I said. I was starting to wonder if it was really such a great idea. Bliss and Pixie were shivering, their hair in rat's tails, and Baxter had splashed mud up to his kneecaps. They got in a worse state jumping about in the little playground and hurtling up and down the slide. Baxter actually started rolling in the ground, but I decided it wasn't really doing any harm, and at least he was using up some of his energy. You're like a little piglet playing in the mud, Baxter, I said. Baxter made revolting grunty pig noises and the others joined in. Pixie pulled her boots off because they were starting to hurt her now. She announced she was paddling. I played this 
Little Piggy went to market with her and she squealed with laughter. Bliss kicked off her trainers, wanting me to do it for her too. They were having such mad fun in the mud I felt tempted to kick my own shoes off and run around madly, just for the fun of it. But then another car drew up in the car park. There was a slamming of a door and then a lot of shouting. At us. What on earth are you children doing? This posh woman shrieked. Her snooty-nosed, elegant, long-haired dog started barking enviously. It was plain she never let him have a lovely roll in the mud. They're just playing, I said. For heaven's sake, it's pouring with rain, she declared, as if we somehow hadn't noticed. Look at the state of you. I was pretty muddy by this time, and the three kids were covered all over, as if they were chocolate-coated. Baxter even had it in his bristly crew cut, so he looked like he had a mud helmet. It's only mud. It'll wash off, I said. Look at your jackets. Yes, I was beginning to worry about their coats. Whatever will your mother say? Where is she? I gestured vaguely towards the toilets at the park gate. Well, you go and find her then. I don't think you should be allowed back in this lovely playground. You've made all the seats and slide muddy. Look, now run along at once. You can't tell us what to do, said Baxter, his chin jutting. It's not your park. It's for everyone. It's for people who love nature, not for little gutter snipes and vandals who want to spoil everything. She peered out at us from her silly, checked rain cap, looking like she really hated us. So we hated her too. When Baxter bent to scoop up a handful of mud, I didn't stop him. He straightened, took aim, and threw it at her. It landed right on top of her rain cap, as if a flying cow had done a dollop on her. She looked so incredibly funny, we all burst out laughing. We simply couldn't help it. She turned a hideous beetroot colour. I grabbed the kids quickly. Run, I said. So we ran for it. I picked up Pixie while Baxter and Bliss legged it for themselves. I hoped she'd give up when we ran towards the gate, but she stormed after us, her delicate-looking dog lolloping along, teeth bared. Run faster, I panted. We got to our corner, whizzed around it, and then I darted through a gate and hid behind someone's hedge, Baxter and Bliss tumbling after me. We flung ourselves down on the muddy ground and lay still, trembling. I put my hand over Pixie's mouth just in case she cried. We heard barking, hasty footsteps, angry shouting. I was sure the dog would sniff us out, but perhaps his long nose was too refined for smelling. We heard them hurtle past us. I waited a little, my heart pounding in my chest, and then dared peep through the hedge. They were much further up the road, veering from pavement to pavement, still looking for us. We had to get moving before they came back down. Quick and quietly, I whispered. We scrambled through the hedge to the gate and ran back down, along the road and then up the next street, which I was pretty sure led to our estate. Bliss and Baxter were running in their bare feet, but they'd had the wit to grab their trainers. My welly boots, Pixie mumbled mournfully, waggling her bare toes. We'll have to go back for them tomorrow, I said. Come on, let's get home now, quick. We'd slowed down, trudging upwards, Bliss limping now and brushing her sodden coat anxiously, though Baxter still stamped along, happy to be a mud boy. We got to the top of the road and found it joined with the first road. And, oh no, oh no, there was the rain-cap woman and her dog coming panting into view. Run again, I gasped. We ran for our flats this time. There was nowhere else to go. The woman was much slower now, clutching her chest, her face still purple-red under her rain-cap. The mud still perched on top, even after all that running. Don't let her follow us back to our flat, I gasped. We have to hide. I know where, said Baxter. He charged past the first block, ducked around the corner and into the bin sheds. We pressed ourselves back against the huge metal container, ankle deep in horribly smelly rubbish, clutching each other. We waited. We heard a dog barking far away in the distance, but nothing more. Has she gone? Bliss whispered. I think so. Better wait a few minutes more, though. Didn't she look funny with that mud on her hat, said Baxter, sniggering. Shh! It was very, very bad of you, Baxter, I whispered, but I started giggling too. We all shook with laughter. When we finally emerged and there was no sign of scary rain cap lady and her dog, we whooped and shouted and high-fived each other. Right, let's get home, I said. We're all badly in need of a bath. What if mum's come back, said Bliss. She'll go bonkers if she sees our clothes. She won't be back. Not yet, I said. My voice wobbled. Baxter slid his hand into mine, surprising me. We don't need her back. It's more fun without her, he said. Yes, it is, said Bliss. You're our mum now, Lily. Pixie, Hadn't even been listening, but she said, Yes, yes, yes. Shut up, you soppy lot, I said, dangerously close to tears. Even so, the kids ran into every room when we got back indoors, obviously looking for mum everywhere. They all drooped when they found the flat was empty. Bath time, bath time, bath time, I shouted into the silence. You three can all have a bath together and we'll squirt washing up liquid in, so we'll have bubbles everywhere. Come on, 
Off with those dirty clothes and stop running about. You're getting muddy footprints everywhere. You're sounding like a real mum now, said Baxter. I got the bath running and swirled washing up liquid around liberally. I helped Pixie out of her clothes and then dangled her in the bath, letting her bounce in the bubbles. Baxter and Bliss came running into the bathroom naked, their bodies pink, their faces and arms and legs chocolate brown. You get in the bath too, Lily, Bliss begged. No, there's no room. I'll have my own bath in a minute, after I've got you lot clean, I said. I let them play for a bit while I sorted through their clothes. I could wash their t-shirts and jeans easily enough, but their jackets were going to be a problem. I tried sponging them with an old rag, but it just stirred up the mud and spread the stains around. I left them in a soggy heap, deciding to wait until the morning. At least I could scrub the children clean. I set to while they squirmed and wriggled and shrieked, and soon they were pink all over. I hoisted them out of the bath one by one, wrapped them in towels. Baxter and Bliss were old enough to dry themselves, but I rubbed them down even so, cosseting them, and I swaddled Pixie, picking her up in my arms, pretending she was my baby. I found them all clean t-shirts and clean pants, and then sat them down in front of the television, while I went to have my bath in peace. I had to scrub out the tub first, because the bottom was all silted with mud, but when it was clean at last, I ran myself a fresh bath, with lots more bubbles. I lay back with a sigh, up to my chin in bubbles, the blood throbbing in my head. I felt so good to stretch out. My arms and back were aching after lumping Pixie around all that time. I closed my eyes and played the Lily Alone game. I was lying in my beautiful jade green marble bath, strewn with rose petals, sipping a glass of champagne. When I was sufficiently relaxed, I'd step out, grab the twenty snow-white towels from the cupboard and dab myself dry. I'd slip on a silky robe and saunter into my white living room. I'd lounge on my vast white velvet sofa and switch on my enormous television, taking up an entire wall. I'd watch a film in total peace, no one wriggling or kicking beside me, no squabbling over the remote, no complaints that the film was too girly, too scary or too silly. I was Lily alone, and no one could ever disturb me, and if the doorbell rang, I simply ignored it. The doorbell was ringing. I sat up so swiftly, the water swooshed over the side of the bath. It's Mum back, Baxter yelled, and I heard him running. No, no, don't go to the door, Baxter, I shouted, jumping out of the bath and running too. Baxter got to the door before me, jumping up and opening the latch, shouting, Mum! 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 It wasn't Mum. I heard a man's voice. No, it wasn't Mikey, thank goodness. This was a kind, gentle voice, deep, the sort of voice that could tell you all sorts of stories and you'd never get tired of listening. It was Mr Abbott, and oh my goodness, there I was, stark naked, dripping in the hall. I flew back to the bathroom, slammed the door and leaned against it. I gnawed on my thumbnail, trying to think what to do. I hoped against hope that Baxter would somehow get rid of him, even slam the door in his face. But I heard more talking, then footsteps. Oh my God, Mr Abbott was in our flat now. I stood there shivering, utterly helpless. Then I heard knocking on the door. Lily? It was Bliss. Lily, it's your teacher, Mr Abbott. Come to see you. Well, I can't see him. I'm in the bath. Look, tell him I'm ill. Tell him we're all ill. Yes, Baxter's telling him a whole load of stuff, but he says he still wants to see you and mum. What was I going to do now? I couldn't let Baxter rabbit on. He'd tell Mr. Abbott the whole story if I didn't shut him up. Tell him I'm coming, I hissed. I didn't even have time to go and look for clean clothes. I pulled on my damp t-shirt and jeans, still thick with mud, and rushed out. Mr. Abbott was sitting in the living room with Baxter. Pixie perched on the arm of his chair. She was prattling away to him, saying stuff about a funny lady with a dog, but luckily he didn't seem to be listening properly. Baxter was strutting around the room in his pants, telling Mr. Abbott that he didn't know where Mum was, and he didn't care because she was bad. Baxter, I said sharply, don't you dare say that about Mum. Of course you know where she is. She's gone to the chemist to get some more medicine for our bad tummies. Bad, 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 Pixie echoed. I didn't know whether she meant bad tummy or bad mummy. I'm not sure she did either. Mr. Abbott was staring at me. I felt myself blushing scarlet. What must he think of me looking such a muddy mess? Hello, Lily, he said gently. I'm sorry you and your family aren't well. You've been off school three days now. Have you seen a doctor? I hesitated. Well, Mum says she'll take us if we're not better tomorrow. Yes, that's a good idea. It's, it's very catching. I wouldn't stay too long. You don't want to go down with it yourself, Mr. Abbott, I said. Well, I'll just stay until your mother gets home, he said. I felt my throat go dry. I tried to swallow. I'll, I'll make a cup of tea, I said desperately. Baxter, Bliss, stop prancing about in your underwear. Go and get some jeans on. Clean ones. You're all dirty, Mac Baxter pointed out unkindly. Do as I say, Baxter, I said fiercely. And Bliss, you find Pixie her dungarees. 
Pixie, leave Mr. Rabbit in peace and go with Bliss. I like Mr. Rabbit, said Pixie, patting his cheek. I like you too, Pixie, said Mr. Rabbit. He smiled as she hopped across the room. Then he followed me into the kitchen. She's a sweet little poppet, very friendly. She tried to climb on my knee. Yes, she just wants attention, I said, putting the kettle on. And Pixie's been poorly too. I must say she seems full of beans today, said Mr. Rabbit. Oh, she's been very poorly. We all have, I said. You certainly look a bit tired and wan, Lily. Such a shame you had to miss the outing to the gallery today. Yes, I said sadly. It's a great shame. That's partly why I've popped round. I've bought you a little souvenir, said Mr. Rabbit, and he took a little white paper bag from his pocket. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, I said, so thrilled that I knocked a teacup over. Don't get too excited. It's nothing much, just a few postcards. Had to pour the boiling water into the teacups with two hands because they were shaking so much. Mr. Rabbit had bought me a present. I went to the fridge to get the milk and then remembered we didn't have any. I stood, agonised, trying to think what to do. I could hardly offer him ice cream with his cup of tea. Mr. Rabbit was watching. I take my tea black, he said quickly. Oh, uh, yes, so do I. It tastes much better that way, I said gratefully. I rubbed around the saucers with a tea towel where I'd spilled a little tea. There, do you take sugar? I knew we had a whole bag of sugar, but he didn't want that either. I sat beside him, terribly conscious of my wet hair and filthy clothes. Here, he said, pressing the paper bag into my hands. I opened it up. There were six postcards inside with pictures of paintings, all blue and pink and scarlet and gold. I thought if you couldn't come to the gallery, I'd bring a little bit of it to you, said Mr. Rabbit. I picked out all the angels I could find. I remember we had a very interesting conversation about wings once. These angels have wonderful multicoloured wings, and look how they vary in size. This one has tiny little flimsy things that fold up like a fan, whereas this one has wings far bigger than himself. If he came to visit you here, he'd have to be very careful getting in the lift, or he'd get them trapped. Oh, Mr. Rabbit, I said again, frilled. He was an angel, flying here to see me and give me my special present. I wanted us to sit together forever, sipping tea and discussing angels. But Baxter and Pixie came running in, sniggering. They were wearing each other's clothes. Baxter was squeezed into one of Pixie's tiny t-shirts, and she was wearing his jeans, shuffling, pix shuffling because the empty ends trailed across the carpet. Bliss crept in anxiously behind them, clearly worried she would be blamed. Oh, <laughs> very funny, I said, sighing. Watch out, uh, Pixie, you'll fall over. And Baxter, take that t-shirt off, you'll rip it. Baxter tried to pull it over his head and got stuck. Can't, he said, charging up and down like a bull. I caught him with one hand and whipped the t-shirt off with the other. Then I grabbed Pixie. Come on, Bliss, help me pull her jeans off. Mr. Abbott watched me, smiling, as I sorted them out. You make a marvellous little mother, Lily, he said. I smiled back at him shyly. Mr. Abbott looked at his watch. When did your mum go out? he asked. Bliss and Baxter looked at me. Oh, oh, not long ago, I said quickly. She might be quite a while, especially if she, she decides to do a big shop. I wouldn't wait if I were you, Mr. Abbott. Your mum has a mobile, doesn't she? Perhaps we could phone her, tell her I'm here. I'd really like to talk to her. Bliss gave a little gasp of dismay. I went on looking steadily at Mr. Abbott. I think, I think I'd better be truthful, Mr. Abbott, I said. The three kids stared at me. I think mum might be a bit... A bit embarrassed if she knew that you knew she'd left us on her own. I said as calmly as I could. She knows she knows she's not supposed to leave us, but it's difficult, see? She's got to do the shopping and she can't cart all of us with her, especially with this bug and us needing the toilet all the time. Does your mum often leave you in charge of the children, Lily? Oh, no, hardly ever. She gets our neighbour to look after us, doesn't she, Bliss? Old calf along the balcony. Bliss nodded vigorously, doing her best to be helpful. And my dad Mikey comes too, said Baxter. Yes, he does. But just this once, they were all out. You see, so, so Mum took a chance. We don't mind. You said how good I was with the kids, Mr. Abbott. Yes, you are. It's just, well, you're still quite young to be in charge, Lily. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to get you or your mum into trouble. I just want to see if I can help in any way. I know how hard it must be for your mum bringing you up single-handed. Maybe if we spoke to social services. No. Oh, please don't. That would get Mum really upset. You won't say anything, will you? Oh, please, Mr. Abbott, promise. Well, I don't know what to do for the best, he said. The best would be for you to go away now before Mum gets back. Please, we'll all get into trouble if she finds out we let you in the house. We're not supposed to even answer the door. Mum will go nuts if she knows. I can understand that, said Mr. Abbott uncomfortably. Well, I certainly don't want to get you into trouble. All right, I'll go away now, but I'll leave you my phone number. If Mum hasn't come back in an hour or so, will you give me a ring? Do you promise? Oh, yes, I promise. I lied. And I hope to see you in school tomorrow. If not, I'll come round again. Now don't look so worried. 
I just want to make sure you're all right. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for my lovely angel postcards. I think you're, you're, well, they're really lovely, Mr. Abbott, I said, and then I blushed because it sounded so silly. I think you're really lovely too, Lily, said Mr. Abbott. I think he was just teasing me. I hoped he might have meant it just a little bit. But when I look, looked in Mum's mirror after he'd gone, I groaned. I looked even worse than I'd imagined, my hair all stringy, a smear of mud still on my nose, and my t-shirt and jeans looked awful, as if I'd been rolling around in a pigsty. Bliss followed me into the bedroom. Are you going to phone Mr Abbott? Of course not. Are we going to school tomorrow? Nope, we can't leave Pixie. Then Mr Abbott will come round again and want to see Mum. Yes, just stop saying the bleeding obvious, will you, Bliss? You're doing my head in, I snapped. But what are we going to do? I don't know. Oh, for goodness sake, don't cry. Trust me, I'll think of something, okay? Chapter 8 I lay awake half the night trying to think what to do. Then I got up really early and sat on the living room floor with my angel postcards spread all around me. I stroked their wings with the tips of my fingers. I imagined white feathers sprouting from my back. Great, strong wings so I could soar into the sky right up over the park. And then I knew what we had to do. It was simple. I sat up and started writing a letter in my best handwriting. Dear Mr. Abbott, Mum has decided to take us all on a little holiday to see if some sea air will make us better. We will be back soon. Thank you very much for my postcards. Love from Lily. I decorated the corners of the letter with flying angels to make it look pretty, colouring them in carefully, and I drew a lily flower beside my name. Then I sat with my head on my knees, planning. I heard Pixie starting to mutter to herself, bouncing about in her cot. I went into our bedroom. Bliss and Baxter were still asleep, curled up together like two little dormice. Pixie smiled at me and put her arms up to be lifted out of her cot. I hauled her out and gave her a big cuddle and then took her to the toilet. When she was sitting there, I played this little piggy with her toes and she giggled delightedly, as if it were a brand new exciting game. There now, Pixie, let's wash our hands and then make breakfast. What would you like for a special treat? Let's see, gravy powder, salt and pepper, cooking fat or ice cream? Ice cream, said Pixie. Ice cream, ice cream. Baxter woke up and heard the magic word too. He hurtled after us into the kitchen. Hey, sleepy boy, I said, catching hold of him and swinging him around. He clung to me like a little monkey and rubbed his bristly head against my cheek. Why don't you stay cuddly like this all day long, eh? I said. Come on, you get the ice cream out of the freezer. I bustled about, setting the table, the children helping me. Bliss hadn't yet appeared when the others were already tucking in, so I went to fetch her. She was still curled up in bed, clutching headless, but her eyes were open. Bliss, baby, what's up? Don't you want to come and have some ice cream for breakfast, I said. Are you still cross with me? She whispered. Oh, darling, I'm not the slightest bit cross. I'm sorry I was mean to you last night. I gave my sister a great big hug. I do love you, Bliss. Come and have some breakfast quick, or Baxter and Pixie will have eaten up all the ice cream. I let them finish up the whole carton, together with a can of peaches. There now, good breakfast, eh? Can we have cornflakes now, said Baxter. No greedy guts. We're saving the cornflakes. I'm going to pack up lots of food. Go and get me mum's big shopper. Are we having a picnic? said Bliss. Yes, we're going to have lots of special picnics. In the magic, magic garden? We're going to have picnics all over the park. Because do you know what? We're going to camp there. Just till Saturday, when mum will come back. Camp, said Baxter, clapping his hands. Where's our tent? We haven't got a tent. You know that, but we'll take a blanket and pillows and the plastic tablecloth to go over the top of us in case it rains. I said, proud that I'd fought it all out. Will there be horrible creepy crawlies if we camp, said Bliss. She'd watched I'm a Celebrity get me out of here. Absolutely not. If even the tiniest little ant dares to come anywhere near, I'll swat it flat. I promise, I said. What about the deer? Oh, Bliss, you're the only person in the entire world who could possibly be afraid of deer. They're so sweet and shy and soft and gentle. They've got those big horn things, Bliss persisted. Antlers, Baxter shouted. I'm a huge great daddy deer, and these are my antlers. He held his arms in an arc over his head and started making snorty noises. Now I'm going to charge. He lunged at Bliss, who started squealing. Stop it, Baxter, I said, grabbing him. Baxter subsided, screwing up his face. What? You're not crying, are you? No, Baxter shouted, though his eyes were watering. I didn't hurt you. I barely touched you, I said, astonished as his tears spilled over. What is it? I want my daddy, Baxter sniffed. Oh, for goodness sake, I said. I tried to put my arms around him, but he pushed me away. I don't want you. I want dad. I sat on the bench, running my finger around my ice cream bowl and licking it. I didn't know what to do. I knew Mikey's mobile phone number. 
All right, he was in Scotland, but if I told him mum had gone off and left us, I thought he'd come, job or not. He loved Baxter, I knew that. He loved Bliss too, though she irritated him. He was fond of Pixie. They'd be safe with him, but I wouldn't. I hated the way he looked at me, some of the things he said. It was just about all right when mum was around. It would be much too scary without her. No, we'd be fine. We just had to hide in the park for two days, and then it would be Saturday and mum would be back. I started packing mum's big shopping bag with cornflakes and biscuits and chocolates and apples and dairy lee and crisps. I put cans of coke and lilt in another bag and filled two empty squash bottles with tap water. There, we had just about enough to keep us going for a couple of days. The bags were very heavy though. I'd have to hang them on Pixie's buggy. I could stuff the buggy with our blankets and pillows too, plus the plastic tablecloth. So what else did we need? A change of clothes each, in case the kids got muddy again. It would be best to pack several pairs of knickers for Pixie, just in case. I gathered up clothes and inspected our coats. I'd forgotten to hang them up so they were still a dank, sodden heap. When it wasn't cold anymore, I had to hope it wouldn't rain again. I found sweatshirts for each of us because I knew it would be cooler at night. I didn't think we need bother with pyjamas. We could just sleep in our clothes. The last bag was for our favourite things. I packed my angel postcards, my drawing pad and crayons, the fairy tale book, headless, the forklift truck and Pixie's pink plastic handbag. There, I said at last. Come on, get dressed and put your sweatshirts on. It's too hot, said Baxter. Yes, but we can't carry them. Not when we've got all these bags. I want you to carry the biggest bag, Baxter. I hope it's not too heavy for you. Heavy? It's ever so light. I can carry it easy peasy, said Baxter proudly. And you must carry the favourite things, Bliss. Do you think you can manage it? I think so, said Bliss. She was scrambling into her clothes, but she looked at her trainers doubtfully. They were thick with mud. Look, she said, holding them at arm's length. It's okay, we'll just brush it off. It's easy now, it's gone hard. Look, we'll put a newspaper on the floor, and then you can bang them together. Baxter started banging his together without benefit of the newspaper, sending flakes of mud everywhere. Pixie sat on the floor, wiggling her pink toes. No welly boots, she said. Well, go and get your shoes, silly. You can put them on yourself, because they've got sticky straps. Pixie put her shoes on and stomped about uncertainly. They feel funny. I looked. You've got them on the wrong feet, silly. Swap them over, honestly. It seemed hours before I got them all ready. When we were going out of the door at last, I had another thought. What if Mum came back early on Friday? She'd go spare if we were missing. I used, used up other, another precious page of my drawing book, scribbling her a note. Dear Mum, don't worry, we are safe and we'll be back Saturday, I promise. Hope you had a lovely holiday. I paused, looking around the flat. Sorry we've made a bit of a mess. Don't be cross. Lots and lots of love, Lily. Baxter and Bliss wanted to print their names at the bottom too, and Pixie did a scribble and a kiss. Then I folded the letter up and put it on Mum's pillow. There, I said. Now, let's go. I left Mr Abbott's letter sticking out of the letterbox, and then I stood for a good two minutes in front of the door, not knowing what to do. If I closed it, we couldn't get back in, and yet if I left it on the latch, Mr Abbott might notice and think it odd. What do you think we should do about the front door? I asked Bliss. She blinked at me anxiously. Shut it, she said, or leave it open. Yes, but which? Shut it, said Baxter, and pulled it. I think he only meant to demonstrate, but he pulled too hard. The door shut with a bang. Now you've done it, I said unfairly. Want to do a wee-wee, said Pixie, fidgeting in her buggy. We well, can't. You'll have to wait till we get to the park. OK, come along, all of you. I started wheeling the buggy along the balcony as quickly as I could, shushing the twins, but old Calf already had her door open. Do you kids have to bang the door, she said, glaring. She had a cigarette in her mouth, and she kept it where she went, kept it there when she talked, so it moved weirdly up and down. Sorry, Calf, I said, wheeling Pixie quickly past. Where are you lot going with all them bags? Calf asked. We're, uh, we're just going down the laundrette, I said. Looks like you're washing clothes for an army, said Calf, looking at the two bulging bags in the buggy. That mum of yours even got the little ones lugging stuff. She poked at Bliss's bag and felt the hard edges of my drawing pad. What's this, then? You lot started to wear cardboard knickers? She cackled at her own stupid joke, the cigarette end wobbling, but staying put. Did she stick it into her lower lip with sellotape? I forced myself to smile at her. These are our favourite things, to keep the kids quiet in the laundrette. Keep you lot quiet? That'll be the day. Your mum couldn't keep her goldfish quiet. I'm telling you, where is she then? I want a word with her. She's downstairs with another two bags of washing, I said. She's getting like the blooming scarlet pimpernel, your mum. You seek her here, you seek her there, and she's always nipped off somewhere else, leaving you in charge. She's got a right cheek, turning you into a nanny all the time. 
I like looking after the kids, I said. Yeah, well, you're just a kid too. Or had you forgotten? I need a wee wee, Pixie said, still fidgeting. No, you don't, darling. You've only just gone. I lied. Well, well, uh, have to get going. I craned my neck to one side, ear up. I think that was mum calling for us. Old calf narrowed her eyes. I didn't hear anything. Well, you don't hear so well when you get older, do you? I said. You cheeky little madam. Come on, kids, I said, wheeling Pixie past her door, making for the lift. It didn't come straight away, so we were stuck there, old calf calling along to us. You watch out. Next time I'm down the social, I'll be telling them a few tales on you lot. Your mum's a shocker, letting you kids run wild and cheek your elders and betters. Why couldn't the old bag mind her own business? When the lift came, at last, Baxter stuck his finger up at her, and I'm afraid I did too. We shot down the lift, spluttering and giggling. You'll make her more cross now, said Bliss. I know, but it was worth it, seeing her face, I said. Can I do wee-wees in the corner of the lift? Asked Pixie. No, look, wait till we get to the park. There are toilets at the entrance. You can wait till we get there. Pixie couldn't wait. I had to take her knickers off and hold her out over a drain on the way. I want to go too, said Bliss. Well, you're too big to do it in the gutter, I said. I can, said Baxter, and demonstrated. A woman stomped past in high heels, glaring. Dirty boy, she said. I saw the look on Baxter's face. I knew he was going to aim at her any second. Don't you dare, I hissed. Hurry and finish. Baxter took no notice, but luckily the woman had stomped on, out of firing range. Put it away, you are a dirty boy, I said. Now look, Bliss is right. We'll make everyone cross with us, and then they really will report us. We don't want anyone noting, noticing us going into the park. They'll know where to look if they start searching for us. They're going to start searching for us, said Bliss. If, now come on, let's get to the park. You, you can hold on till then, can't you, Bliss? I hope so, she said anxiously. It seemed a longer trek than usual to the park, because I was pushing the heavy buggy, and we were all loaded up with bags. When we got to the park gates at last, I was busting to go to the toilet, let alone Bliss. I started dragging Baxter in with us, but he struggled violently, pulling her face. I'm not going in the ladies' toilets, he said. I won't, I won't, you can't make me. All right, but wait right outside. Do you hear me? Promise you won't budge. I promise. Promise on mum's life. Yes. So we left him outside. I wheeled Pixie into the toilets with us because I didn't want Baxter messing about with the buggy. It was so loaded up with bags that it tipped over at a touch, especially if Pixie stood up or wriggled around. I let Bliss go to the loo first, while I minded Pixie. And then I had my turn. I want to go too, Pixie said. No, you don't. You've only just been. Right in the street where everyone could see you. I want to go again, Pixie insisted. Nonsense. I'm nearly wetting. I sighed and got Bliss to hang on to the buggy handle while I hauled Pixie out on into, the, into a toilet. She sat there, waving her legs and laughing. Come on, Pixie. It won't come. Well, you didn't need to go then. Come here. I lifted her off and pulled her knickers up, but the second she was back in her buggy, she started all over again. Want to do a wee-wee? You're just playing silly games with us. You're so naughty, Pixie. It isn't funny, I said sternly. Bliss was covering her mouth, making little snorty noises. It is a little bit funny, she spluttered. We both laughed then, and Pixie cackled too, proud that she was such a brilliant entertainer. Come on, you giggly sillies, I said, wheeling Pixie's buggy out of the toilets. Sorry we've been so long, Baxter, I started saying. But Baxter wasn't there. Baxter? Baxter, I told you to stay here. You promised, I said, raising my voice. I thought he was hiding behind the hedge, but there was no sign of him. I wondered if he'd gone to the gents' toilets and called outside. I even ran in quickly to check, but he wasn't there either. Oh no, where's he gone, I said. He's so bad, said Bliss. Bad, 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 said Pixie in a silly voice, wanting to make us laugh again, but it wasn't funny any more. I screwed up my eyes and squinted as far as I could see, up the big hill, along the path in front, around near the road. I couldn't see Baxter anywhere. He's run away, said Bliss, starting to cry. Of course he hasn't. He's just being naughty, hiding. I looked over to the car park. I bet he's over there, hiding behind one of those cars. Come on, we'll go and look for him. We crossed the road carefully and went into the car park. It was hard work pushing the buggy on the gravel. I zigzagged round the rows of cars as best I could, while Bliss ran ahead calling for Baxter. I kept expecting him to leap out at us, shouting boo, but nothing happened. There was still no sign of him. A man unwound his car window. What's up, girlies? Has your dog run away? Tell you what, why don't you get in my car and I'll, I'll drive you around to see if we can spot him. He looked kind and concerned, but there was something odd about his smile. 
We're not allowed to talk to strangers, I gabbled, and I ran with the buggy, tugging Bliss along with me. Was that a bad man, she panted. I don't know. Maybe. Lily, do you think a bad man's grabbed Baxter? Of course not, I said, but the idea panicked me. Baxter thought he was so streetwise, but he was just a very little kid. If some Mikey-type guy in a flash car had driven up outside the toilets and offered Baxter a lift, he'd have been off like a shot. Oh God, why didn't I make him come into the toilets with us? The man who had spoken to us was getting out of his car now, still looking over at us. Quick, we've got to get out of here, I said. Let's go in that little playground. We ran hard. Pixie jolted up and down in the buggy. She laughed at first, thinking it a game, but then she started to get frightened. Slow down, slow down, she demanded. We can't, Pixie. We're looking for Baxter. Baxter's there, she said. What? Where? I whirled around. No, he's not, Pixie. This isn't a silly game. Baxter's gone missing. Baxter, 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 said Pixie, pointing up in the air, as if her brother was floating above her head. I crouched down at her level and looked upwards too. I saw the top of Baxter's head bobbing up and down inside the little playground. I ran, and there he was, jumping about on top of the slide, yelling, I'm the boss of this den! I parked Pixie with bliss and scrambled up after him. Get down! He thought I was playing and aimed a twig at me like a gun, pretending to fire. I slapped it out of his hand and then I slapped him. Ouch! Stop it! Don't hit me! I'll hit you back harder! He yelled. I told you to stay outside the toilets and you promised you would. You promised on mum's life. I didn't want to stay outside any smelly lady's toilets. He wailed, knuckling his eyes. We thought you were lost, you stupid little idiot, I said, giving him a shake for emphasis. I'm not stupid, you are. You're a mean, fat, farty pig and I hate you, Baxter said, the tears rolling down his cheeks. I hate you too, I said, but already I felt the anger seeping out of me. I searched my pocket and found a little screwed up tissue. I dabbed at Baxter's face with it. Get off, he said. I didn't get off. I pulled him closer, and when I hugged him, he leaned against me, allowing himself to sob because his face was hidden. Bliss was crying too, standing forlornly beside Pixie in the buggy. Come on, Baxter, let's get down, I said gently. We've got to give Bliss a hug too. I slid down and Baxter slid after me on his tummy. It's okay, Bliss. Baxter's safe and sound. I'm not cross anymore. It's all right now, I said. Bliss went on howling. It's not all right, she gasped between sobs. It's mum. Mum, what do you mean? Baxter swore on mum's life, so now she'll be dead. Oh no, she won't. Don't say that. Especially not in front of Pixie. No, mum's fine. She'll be having a lovely time with this new boyfriend of hers, I said bitterly. She'll be lying on the beach in a new bikini right this minute, snogging away. Yuck, said Baxter. Yes, double yuck, I said. We won't worry about mum. Bliss, she's not the slightest bit worried about us. We can manage just fine without her, if we're all careful. We've got to stick together. Do you hear that, Baxter? This isn't a game where we can all muck about. This is deadly serious. We've got to hide here till Saturday, which means we've got to stay out of everyone's way, not draw attention to ourselves. From now on, we have to act like we're invisible. We absolutely mustn't shout back at people or be rude or cheeky or do anything at all that makes them remember us. We must just look like four children out for the day with their mum or their dad and our grown-up just happens to have run ahead or lagged behind. Whatever. The buggy suddenly fell over. Pixie had got bored during my long lecture and had managed to wriggle out of the straps. She'd made a bolt for freedom and tipped it up. She started yelling hard. I picked her up and held her. Where does it hurt, Pixie? I said, feeling her arms and legs. Everywhere, Pixie roared. When I punched and prodded each bit, she didn't roar harder, so I decided she was more or less okay. Right then, I said, stuffing her back into the buggy and reloading it with the bulging bags. Off we go. I wasn't sure where we were going to. We had to make a secret, secret camp somewhere, but I didn't know which spot to pick. I was tired out already, and it was much harder work pushing the buggy over grass, but it wouldn't make sense to make our camp near the park entrance where so many people might spot us. The magic garden. The magic garden, Bliss cried. I knew there'd be lots of hiding places there. We'd already hidden beneath the willow tree, but that was just playing a game. The willow fronds weren't thick enough. We'd be on plain view to everyone. Anyway, there were too many people circling the pond and feeding the ducks. We'd be found in five minutes. There were hundreds of big bushes all over the magic garden. We could creep under one and crouch there, but we couldn't stay crouched permanently. No, the magic garden wasn't the right place for us. We're not going to the magic garden straight away, I said. We'll go there later, Bliss, after we've found a camp and hidden all our things. We could camp back at the playground, said Baxter. I could be the boss guy and live at the top of the slide. 
Baxter, a children's playground isn't the best place to hide. Like, there will be other children there. I'll tell them to shove off. I'll be the boss, see? No, we need a really secret place where no one else in the park goes, away from the car park and the playgrounds. I looked all around again. Let's go that way, I said, pointing to a yellowy, sandy path in the opposite direction to the hill. At least it would be easier to push the buggy along it. Follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road, the yellow sand road, I said, singing the song from The Wizard of Oz. I did a little skippy dance to the tune. Follow, 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 follow the yellow sand road. Come on, Bliss, Baxter, you've all seen the film. They hopped and skipped too, and Pixie drummed her heels in the buggy. Pa Baxter picked up a fallen branch and waved it dangerously in the air, conducting us. We're not off to see any real wizard, are we, said Bliss. No wizards whatsoever, just us. We're going to find a very special secret place to make our camp. That's easy peasy, said Baxter. This will be a good camp, he said, whacking a very small tree with his stick. We'll camp right up in the branches, and when anyone comes near, we'll see them and shoot them. Bang, bang, bang. So how are we all going to get up in the tree, Baxter? Climb up, stupid, said Baxter. He tried to demonstrate. He clearly saw himself shinning up like a little monkey after coconuts. He looked extremely puzzled when he couldn't even get as far as the first branch. He tried again and again while we waited patiently, and then he lost his temper and started kicking the tree, as if it was being deliberately awkward. Oh, Baxter, stop it. You're not hurting the tree. You're hurting yourself. You shut up, he shouted, and started kicking me too. You're being silly. Ouch, you're hurting me now. Look, you've been clever and found a branch. Let's all find branches too, and maybe we can stick them in the ground and put the tablecloth over them. So it's like a little tent. My voice tailed away. I'd been just like Baxter. I'd pictured us in a cosy tent in the middle of this beautiful park, but I hadn't thought exactly how it was all going to work. I tried sticking Baxter's branch into the earth. I couldn't get it to stand upright. And anyway, the tablecloth wasn't anywhere near big enough when I held it out. That's a stupid idea, said Baxter. That's not a tent. He snatched his branch back and poked at the tablecloth contemptuously. Don't, Baxter, you'll tear our tent, said Bliss, trying to rescue the tablecloth. Oh, let him tear it. It's not going to work anyway, I said. I don't know how to make a proper tent. Perhaps with the blankets, said Bliss, gathering them up and flapping them. Yes, but how, I said. A dog came running up off his lead and started barking eagerly. No, go away, help, Bliss shrieked. She flapped harder, which only made him more excited. It's okay, Bliss. Just stand still. He won't hurt you. He's only little, I said. But she was too scared to listen and ran away up the grassy bank. Hey, silly doggy, play with me, not her, said Baxter, waving the tablecloth at the dog. The dog darted backwards and forwards joyfully, convinced this was a wonderful new game. A youngish woman in jeans came striding towards us, whistling. Hey, Sammy, down, boy. I'm sorry, kids. He's just having fun. He won't hurt you, she called. He's lovely. Aren't you, Sammy, said Baxter, holding the tablecloth towards him enticingly and then flicking it away. Sammy leapt up, caught the edge in his teeth, and rolled on the ground with it, wrapping himself inside. He's like a big sausage roll, Baxter said, roaring with laughter, totally over his temper tantrum. He is a sausage, my Sammy, said the woman. Oh dear, is that your picnic cloth? I'm so sorry. Your mother will be furious. She won't mind. It's only an old cloth, I said quickly. Out you come, Sammy, said the woman, scrabbling for him. He jumped free, his paws bicycling in the air. And then he made a mad dash for the buggy. Pixie squealed excitedly, but he wasn't after her. He was after the food bag. Oi, don't you dare. You're not galloping up the picnic too. <laughs> Bad boy, said the woman. She clipped the lead on his collar and then fished in her jeans pocket. She brought out three pound coins and held them out to me. Here, buy yourself some ice cream for after the picnic. Thank you, I said. Ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, said Pixie happily. Sammy can come and play with us any time, said Baxter. The woman strode off with Sammy leaping around at her heels. I like that lady, said Baxter. Give me my pound then, Lily. I'll look after the money. Pity she didn't see Bliss too. We'll have to share free ice creams between four, I said, looking around. Where is she? Bliss, it's okay, you can come back. The dog's gone now. I couldn't see any sign of her. Bliss, Bliss. I ran up the grassy slope and still couldn't see her. Had she kept on running? She was only little, but she could run fast, especially if she was in a blind panic. Why hadn't I gone after her straight away? Oh, Bliss, please come here. You're scaring me, I shouted. Silly Bliss, said Baxter, but he was peering round too, nibbling his lip. Where's she gone, Baxter? Did you see which way she went? He shrugged. Over there or by those trees, I don't know. She's so silly, he said, 
I'll find her. No, don't you go off too. Honestly, I think I need to strap all three of you into the buggy so I can keep you safe. They'd squash me. Can we have ice cream now, said Pixie, not the slightest bit concerned about her missing sister. After we found Bliss. Look, you sit still in your buggy like a good girl and guard all the bags, okay? Baxter, you come with me. I took his hand and we went searching for Bliss. Please, Bliss, come back. The dog's gone. Please come back, I shouted, blundering through the trees, knee-deep in ferns. I haven't gone away, said Bliss. Baxter and I started, spinning around. We'd both heard her. We were sure of that. But where was she? She'd sounded as if she was right beside us, but she was nowhere to be seen. Bliss? Hello, she said. I peered down in the bracken, wondering if she could be hiding there. No, I'm here, look, she said, giggling. Sounded like she was in the huge old tree beside us, but we still couldn't see her. Baxter jumped for the first branch, hauled himself up, and then started laughing. Bliss laughed too. I climbed up after him, and there was Bliss, standing triumphantly in the to to totally hollow tree. Wow, make room for me, said Baxter, and he jumped down beside her. There was much less room for me, but I slivered down too. As long as I crouched down a little, I was totally invisible to any passers-by. You clever girl, Bliss, I said, kissing the top of her head. You found us the perfect hiding place. And that is where we will leave part four of Lily Alone by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and loads more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe to my channel or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye bye.